Well, good evening. I'm Gerald McKeegan. I'm an astronomer here at the Chabot Space and Science Center. Uh, Chabot Space and Science Center is on Skyline Boulevard up in the Oakland Hills. Oh, it looks like now we've started. Okay, let's try one more time here. Uh, good evening. Oh, yes. My name is Gerald McKeegan. I'm an astronomer here at the Chabot Space and Science Center. Uh, the Chabot Space and Science Center is in the Oakland Hills on Skyline Boulevard. Now, normally we open the observatories on Friday and Saturday night here at Chabot and let you look through our three big telescopes. But unfortunately, because of the coronavirus situation, we can't uh, bring you to our telescopes. So we thought it'd be a good idea if we brought the telescopes to you. So we're gonna tell you a little bit about one of our telescopes and a little bit about how that telescope was involved in one of the great Apollo missions. So to get started here, uh, you see a telescope behind me here. This is the telescope we call Rachel. We give all of our telescopes names. This one is Rachel. Rachel was built in 1915, and it's a 20 inch refractor. It's a pretty big telescope. In fact, it's the longest telescope we have here at Chabot. In fact, I'm gonna tilt the camera here so you can get an idea how big it is. You see it goes quite a ways up there. Now looking at it this way, you probably don't get a good sense of its size. So I'm gonna go over to the telescope and let you see how big it is compared to maybe a six foot one. So you can see how big it is. The telescope is a 20 inch refractor. So that means the diameter of the telescope is 20 inches. Uh, this is a refracting telescope, so it has a lens at the front end, and there's a long hollow tube, and at the back end is where the eyepiece is. So 20 inches in diameter, 31 feet long. Now, uh, Rachel can be moved by hand. In fact, it's the only way we can move it. Rachel is not computer controlled, so when we want to point the telescope at an object, we have to move it around by hand. And you can see it's very easy to move. In fact, the telescope is so well balanced on the pier that I can push it with one finger. And the neat thing about that is the part that I'm moving weighs 4,000 pounds. So it's a lot of weight, but very well balanced on the top of the pier. Telescope, uh, like I said, when we want to point it at an object, we have to move it by hand. Once we get on that object, we have to move the telescope to compensate for the Earth's rotation. So the Earth rotates once a day. Uh, the telescope has to rotate at the same speed, but in the opposite direction. To do that, today, we use a electric motor that's on the telescope. It's up near the top of the telescope on the pier. But back in the day, when the telescope was first built, they didn't use an electric motor. They did it with a mechanical drive. It was like a, the drive on a grandfather clock. So there was a chain and a weight. You pull the chain, it raises the weight. And then as the weight descends, it drives the telescope at the right speed. And the idea is that you rotate the telescope in the opposite direction that the Earth is rotating, but at the same angular rate, and that uh, keeps the object centered. If we didn't do that, the object that we're looking at with the telescope would drift out of the field of view in uh, less than a minute. So we have to compensate for the Earth's rotation in order to, uh, to keep the object centered. Uh, like I say, the telescope was built in 1915, and uh, it was built by the Warner and Swayze Company, and they also, and the optics were built by uh, John Brashear. Uh, Warner and Swayze in 1915, they wanted to um, kind of brag about the telescope. Um, at the time, there was a, an exhibition going on in San Francisco, the Panama Pacific Exhibition, and Warner and Swayze wanted to display the telescope at that exhibition. So after they built the telescope, Rather than delivering it directly to the Chabot Observatory, they delivered it to the Panama Pacific Exhibition, and it was exhibited there for most of the year 2015. And then in December of that year, it was moved up to the Chabot Observatory, and it officially started uh, public viewing in March of 2016. So it's been around for a long time. This telescope's 105 years old, 
but it still works great. We still use it, like I say, every weekend for public viewing. We still do some astrophotography with it. It's a great telescope, and it's, it's really a cool telescope to look at because it's so, so dramatic looking. Uh, when you come into the dome uh, and you see this 31-foot long telescope, it's pretty impressive. So that's a little bit about the telescope. We do have two other telescopes here. We have an eight inch refracting telescope, which is the original Chabot Observatory Telescope, actually original Oakland Observatory Telescope. Uh, that one is called LEA. And then we have a much newer telescope, uh, Nelly, which is a 36 inch reflecting telescope. Reflectors use mirrors instead of uh, lenses. So we'll talk about those telescopes at another time. Now what we wanted to do is kind of give you a little background about how uh, Rachel was involved with the Apollo missions, in particular the Apollo 13 mission. So bear with me here for a second. We're going to switch to some slides. Here we go. All right, I think we're ready to go. So this is uh, Rachel. This is a nice color picture of it. And you can see how dramatic it looks. Uh, people are really impressed. Uh, this picture was taken at nighttime while we were observing with the telescope. So the, uh, the shutters are open. Uh, when we observe with the telescope, we point the telescope manually where we want it to be. Once we get it locked down, then we move the telescope or rather move the shutters to line them up with the telescope. And over the course of the night, as the object is moving across the sky because of the Earth's rotation, we periodically have to move the shutters to catch up with the uh, telescope. The telescope, like I said before, is moving automatically. The, the dome does not move automatically, so periodically you'll see us repositioning the dome to keep the uh, telescope uh, looking through the, the dome rather than looking at it. Uh, here's a close-up of the telescope, the back end of the telescope. This is where all the business happens. Uh, eyepiece we use, the, the eyepiece you see there is, a, is an old-style eyepiece. When we do public viewing, we use a much more modern eyepiece. Uh, when we do astrophotography, we take the eyepiece off and we uh, put a camera on in its place. Now, you notice the craftsmanship. Back in 1915, they were a lot better at doing craftsmanship, so, so they didn't just make the telescope functional, they made it look good as well. So there's lots of brass components on it, and actual wood components and so forth. Makes it look really classic. There are two small telescopes on the side of the main telescope. Those are what we call finder scopes. The finder scopes have a much wider field of view. The main telescope when you look through it, its field of view is very small. If you imagine holding a soda straw in your hand at arm's length and looking through it, that's about the size of the field of view of the main telescope. So when we're trying to find an object, because we're searching around manually, uh, it's good to have other telescopes with a wider field of view to help find the object that we're looking for. And that's where those finder scopes uh, come in handy. Now, this is what the telescope looks like today, but this is what it looked like back in 1970. And 1970 was in the middle of the Apollo program, the Apollo moon landing programs. And it turned out that Chabot and, and Rachel, and actually all of the telescopes here at Chabot, uh, were involved in helping to track the Apollo spacecraft during their flights to and from the moon. This is the location where it was at at that time. Uh, like I said earlier, Chabot is up here on uh, Mount or on Skyline Boulevard, uh, Redwood Ridge in the Oakland Hills. Previously, it was down on Mountain Boulevard, down in the Leona Heights region of Oakland. And this is the building it was in. You see two domes there. The one on the left housed the 20-inch uh, refractor, Rachel. And the one on the right housed the 8-inch refractor, Leia. Uh, at that time, we did not have the 36-inch reflecting telescope. That wasn't built until after we moved up to the Skyline Boulevard site. So let's talk a little bit about Apollo 13. 
Uh, I'm going to give you kind of the short version of our story. I wanted to let you know that a week from now, actually on Saturday the 25th, uh, another individual is going to uh, give a more detailed presentation, Dave Rodriguez, who is in the East Bay Astronomical Society. He's going to give a much more detailed and personal view. He was actually involved in some of the things we're going to talk about tonight. So you want to be able to check in with that as well. So, Apollo 13, often called uh, a successful failure. Apollo 13 took off on April 11th, 1970, and the plan was to take three astronauts to the moon, orbit around the moon. Two of those astronauts would get into a separate vehicle called the lunar module, go down to the surface of the moon, collect samples, wander around for a while, and then return to the mothership called the command module and then fly back home. That was how it was supposed to be. And for the first couple of days of the flight, things went pretty well. But then on April 13th, 55 hours and 53 minutes into the flight, things went bad. And you've probably all seen the movie or heard at least uh, the expression, okay, Houston, we've had a problem. That was spoken by the commander, uh, Jim Lovell. And what had happened was when, when the command module pilot, uh, Jack Swikert, attempted to stir the oxygen tanks, uh, there was a short circuit and it caused the tank to explode. Now, the electrical power for the command module uh, came from fuel cells, and the fuel cells used oxygen as part of their fuel to generate electricity. And unfortunately, when the tank exploded very quickly, they lost their fuel cells, and they were living on batteries from the command module. That was not a good deal. So after a few hours of trying to figure out uh, what they were going to do, trying to recover, they eventually realized that there was just no way that the command module could continue to operate, uh, that if they didn't do something quick, they were going to run the batteries down and there'd be no way for them to return to Earth. So the crew moved into the lunar module. The lunar module was designed for two people, but for the remainder of the mission, it was the lifeboat for all three astronauts. It was still attached to the command module, and I'm going to show you in a minute here what that all looks like so you'll get a better idea. Uh, but that's where they live for the remainder of the mission up until the time it was time to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. On April 14th, a little later on, uh, they fired the descent engine of the lunar module to put them into what was called a free return trajectory. Now, the lunar module's descent engine wasn't designed for this. It was actually designed for landing on the moon. <clears throat> but because they had lost power in the command module and because the uh, oxygen tank in the service module had exploded, they could not use the engine that was in the service module. And so they had to use the, the lunar module descent engine to put them into a free return trajectory. Their normal trajectory would have taken them and put them into orbit around the moon. The free return trajectory just put them into a loop that went around the moon and came right back to the Earth. And I'll show you a little bit more about that in a second. <coughs> uh, it was a pretty hair-raising few days, but eventually on April 17th, exactly 50 years ago today, the Apollo 13 crew returned safely to the Earth. Now, I want to switch back to the live view here, if I can. There we go. And I'm going to show you, I've got a model here of all these modules that I'm talking about. So this is called, this is the service module and the command module. So the service module is this long section here. And the engine at the bottom here is what they were supposed to use to put themselves in the correct trajectory as they orbited the moon and returned to the Earth. Uh, unfortunately, an oxygen tank in the side of the uh, service module exploded. It actually blew out the side of the service module. And so it was pretty much useless after that. 
On top of the service module, this conical shape here, that's the command module. That's the primary home for the astronauts, or was supposed to be the primary home for the astronauts. Uh, the spacecraft, as it was traveling to the moon, was attached to the lunar module. <coughs> Excuse me. So I can attach it here like this. I don't know how well you can see that. But uh, this is how they were flying to the moon. Now, my model has the landing legs extended on the lunar module. Uh, as they were flying to the moons, the landing legs were retracted. So that's the only difference. But what happened was they had to come out of the command module, go into the lunar module, and stay there for the duration of the flight. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, back to the slides here. All right, so. <coughs> Sorry about that. Let's see if I can get my slides to advance here. There we go. Okay. So here's our free return trajectory. And as you can see, it's just a loop around the moon outbound loop, and then they, again, they were supposed to go into orbit, but instead they just looped around the moon and came back towards, yeah, there we go, came back towards the Earth. So that was the plan. Tracking of the, uh, of the Apollo spacecraft was done primarily by the manned spaceflight network, and that consisted of quite a few uh, radio telescopes, radio dishes that were in communication with the spacecraft could be used to communicate with the spacecraft and also to track it. There was an idea that it might be a good idea to kind of augment that using optical observations, telescopic visual observations. And out of that came the optical tracking network. And this was uh, manned by professional and amateur uh, astronomers in, in their own observatories or in, in different uh, observatories around the country. The idea was that um, in addition to the tracking data from the manned spaceflight ne network, uh, they were hoping that they could get more precise positions using uh, the augmented data from the optical tracking network. Chabot was one of the observatories in this program. The telescopes were operated during this uh, program by the East Bay Astronomical Society. The team doing this was led by Dr. Terry Galloway, who unfortunately is not with us anymore. Uh, but he, had, he and several adult members of the EAS uh, operated the telescope for this program. They were assisted also by some teenage uh, volunteers here at the Chabot uh, Observatory. Uh, Chabot then and now had programs for teenagers to be involved in various projects, and that was the case back then. Uh, I mentioned earlier that Dave Rodriguez is going to be doing his presentation next weekend. Dave was one of those teenagers, so you want to be sure to, to tune in and listen to his perspective on, on all of this. The work they did was very tedious. They were doing visual observation through the telescope and taking what they saw in the telescope and hand plotting it on graph paper. And you'll see that in a few minutes. Uh, this is not an easy task. They had to be able to accurately plot the positions of the stars that they saw in the field of view of the telescope and accurately plot the position of the spacecraft as it was moving through that field of view. And doing that all by hand, in addition to moving the telescope itself by hand, was pretty, pretty tedious project. There were no laptops or personal computers back then, uh, no digital cameras, so this was all done visually, looking through the telescopes and plotting on paper. Once again, this is the, uh, the trajectory, the free return trajectory. As the spacecraft was returning from the moon, there came a time when they needed to make one last critical burn of the LEMS engines 
uh, prior to re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere. When they did this, it was very critical that they get it just right. Uh, if they entered the atmosphere at too steep an angle, they would burn up. If they entered the atmosphere at too shallow an angle, they would bounce off the atmosphere and go back out into space. And if that happened, they had no way of getting back to the Earth. So it was really important that they get this just right. Now you see the little green arrow up at the top here. That's approximately where they were at the time they needed to make this last burn. They were about five hours away from re-entry. But they needed to make sure that they calculated the exact time of the burn and the exact duration of the burn. Uh, and there was a feeling among NASA that, that augmenting the, uh, the manned spaceflight network data with some visual observations would help to make sure they did that just right. So NASA started polling the observatories and they discovered that the only one that had clear skies was the Chabot Observatory. So NASA Ames uh, Research Center contacted Chabot and asked that they provide a position of the spacecraft at exactly 0600 universal time on April the 17th. Now, the mission is working on universal time, which uh, is eight hours, at that time was eight hours different than standard time, Pacific standard time. Uh, so 0600 universal time on April the 17th was 10 o'clock p.m. Pacific time on April 16th. Now, some of you are saying, hey, wait a minute, uh, we're on daylight saving time on April 17th, so how could it be eight hours different? Shouldn't it be seven hours different? Well, actually, in 1970, daylight saving time didn't start until the end of April rather than the end of March like it does now. So they were still on standard time, so it was still an eight-hour difference. So the instructions that they were given was if they were able to find the spacecraft and plot its position at the exact time they needed it, they were to report that via the Astronet Telephone Network. The Astronet Network was their version of what we would say now is the internet. That was how they contacted each other. They talked by phone to all the different observatories and to uh, NASA. So they were re to report to Houston the coordinates that they came up with uh, using the Astronet telephone network. This is what they had to work with. So they look through the telescope, they see a field of view. If they're lucky, they've pointed the telescope in the right direction so that the approximate position of the, of the spacecraft was in the field of view. Once they did that, they then had to identify all the major stars in the field of view and plot them on graph paper. So they see the stars, they know approximately where they're pointing, and they look up the coordinates for the, the brighter stars in the field of view and plot them on graph paper, try to accurately plot them on graph paper to represent the, the X and Y coordinates of the field of view. Uh, astronomers use a coordinate system similar to the GPS system, uh, and I'll show you that in a minute, and it's just a way of identifying locations in the sky. So they had to identify the stars, figure out where the stars were, plot them on graph paper, then look again at, through the telescope, find the spacecraft, which would be moving through the field of view and at the exact time requested, uh, note its position relative to the stars and then very quickly plot that on the graph paper. So I'll show you what that actually looks like here. This is an image of the actual graphical plot of the data that they gathered on the night of the, the 16th of, of April here in, in California on the 17th mission time. And you see a scale across the bottom. That bottom scale is the east-west scale, uh, what astronomers call the right ascension scale. Uh, the vertical column on the left is the north-south scale, what we call declination. And star coordinates are given in right ascension and declination. 
And so looking through the field of view of the telescope, they plotted the positions of the stars. And so you see all these little dots here. Those are the stars that they plotted. And then they looked again through the telescope and plotted the position of the spacecraft as it moved along. And that's what you see here. The critical data they needed was the position at exactly 0600. So that data point right there is uh, the position at 0600. Uh, you kind of get an idea what it looked like without and with the, the red circle here. And it turned out that their, their position data was very good. It was actually a little bit better than some of the data they were getting from the manned spaceflight network. So uh, it was useful data. Uh, once they got that data, they, they got on the astronaut phone network, reported it to NASA, and then NASA used it to compute uh, along with all the data from the manned space flight center or, or the manned space flight network, they used it to compute the, uh, the time of the burn and the duration of the burn. So this is an image showing the actual timeline of the mission. These are the last few hours of the mission. And I've inserted into it the point at which Chabot uh, got the data for the position. And you see it was several hours, actually about uh, almost uh, seven hours before they actually did the mid-course correction. But of course they had to get the data, do the calculation, figure out the timing and the duration. And then the mid-course correction burn was actually done about seven hours, a little less than seven hours after those data were gathered by Chabot. Five hours after that, the spacecraft re-entered the Earth's atmosphere and splashed down in the Pacific Ocean and the spacecraft was recovered. The astronauts were safely recovered. You notice that the astronauts are not wearing those uh, full body protective suits that you saw the Apollo 11 and Apollo 12 astronauts wearing. Uh, those suits were to protect uh, folks on Earth from any microbes that the astronauts might have brought back from the moon. But since Apollo 13 astronauts did not land on the moon, they did not need to wear those protective garments. So they were recovered on a helicopter, brought back to the USS Iwo Jima. And you see them here getting off the helicopter to three very happy and very safe astronauts safely returned from a very harrowing experience in space. And we'd like to think that their return was at least a little bit in part due to the work done on Chabot's 20 inch refracting telescope, Rachel. Okay, well that's our story. What I'd like to do now, is switch back to live view here if I can and I'm sure there are folks who have questions, so if you're texting quote questions on the chat line here, we'll try to take a look at them and answer any questions that you have. Uh, I see lots of people telling me, saying hello. Um, if anybody has any questions, go ahead and type them in and I'll be glad to answer them. Looks like I've stumped the stars here. <laughs> Well, I don't see any questions. Let's see. Oh, I see what's going on. I need to scroll down here. There we go. All right. <clears throat> Well, I see lots of people saying hi. And a few people saying they're home alone bored, so hopefully this is taking a little bit of the boredom out. Uh, okay, here's a question from McKinley, age seven. He asks, how did they get through the atmosphere with a parachute? 
Well, initially they entered the atmosphere without a parachute. Um, by the time it was time to enter the atmosphere, the only part of the spacecraft that was left was the command module. There's this conical section here. Uh, I might be able to get it off here. Um, and the back end of the command module has a heat shield on it. And as they entered the atmosphere, uh, they were heat shield down. The heat shield would uh, take most of the heat of re-entry. When they first enter the atmosphere, they get very hot because of friction with the atmosphere and they have to dissipate that heat and that's what the heat shield did. I actually was able to get this undone here, I think. Yeah, here we go. All right, so by the time they returned to the Earth, the only thing that was left of the spacecraft was this part right here. And when they entered the Earth's atmosphere, they entered heat shield down and the heat shield got very hot, uh, actually white hot, and some of it actually blew off. It's called ablation. And that was to protect the astronauts from the heat of reentry. Once the spacecraft got low enough in the atmosphere to where the air was dense enough, then they opened those three big parachutes and that allowed them to drift down and land in the ocean. Okay, let's see. Uh, Chris Ellison asks, was Chabot's data the only data to use? No, uh, actually most of the data used for this was provided by the uh, Manned Space Flight Network. Uh, the idea of the Chabot data was simply to try to augment it, try to get a little bit better uh, um, uh, precision and make sure they got that burn correct. Uh, let's see, what else we got here? We got uh, how long before the 6 p.m. time did the astronauts or the astronomers start the charting? Actually, they started it about half an hour beforehand. Uh, if you noticed on the uh, chart that I showed you, there were two other plots that were done earlier. Uh, so they were kind of getting themselves ready and making sure they were tracking it right. So that by the time it was 0600, they could get, get the, the good numbers that, that NASA needed. Uh, Richard Ozier asks, how did NASA determine distance and velocity of the spacecraft at that time? Well, um, when you send a radio message to the, the spacecraft, it takes time for that message to go out and it takes time to come back. And by using the timing of those messages and what's called the Doppler uh, effect, which means the frequency changes a little bit in one direction when you're going towards uh, the, the receiver and it uh, changes in another direction when you're going away, uh, you can compute both the distance and the velocity of the spacecraft using the, the radio signals. I see Rusty Schweikert is on here. Rusty Schweikert is an Apollo astronaut. He's probably laughing at my version of the story here right now. He says, uh, uh, Gerald, were you able to actually watch that final burn? Uh, no, I was not. I was uh, going to college in San Diego at the time, and believe it or not, I was, uh, I shouldn't admit this, I was in the middle of a, um, anti-war demonstration at the time this was going on. So I missed it. Uh, let's see. Marco, were there any teenagers there helping that night since it was 10 o'clock PM? Well, I talked to uh, Dave uh, Rodriguez earlier and he said that was just about the maximum time that he could stay at the uh, observatory. You know, he's gonna talk next weekend and tell you about his experiences. Uh, my impression from my conversation was, yes, he was there, but uh, he had to leave not too long after that. They got that 10 p.m. Uh, observation. And let's see, going down here. Nancy, uh, how accurately was the landing spot calculated? Um, fairly accurately. They were within sight of the recovery ship when they came down. So they, they got it pretty darn dead on. Uh, Haley, was Chabot involved in earlier course comparisons? Yes, actually Chabot was involved with several of the Apollo missions uh, and they actually had done observations of the spacecraft, of the Apollo 13 spacecraft 
earlier in the mission before they, they had the accident. Um, when the spacecraft is launched, um, it sits on top of a very tall stack of uh, rocket, the Saturn V uh, vehicle, which has several stages. And the last stage uh, actually holds the lunar module inside a, a casing. And when it's time for them to attach the command module to the lunar module, the command module actually uh, uh, detaches, turns around, and then comes back in and connects to the lunar module. The lunar module is surrounded by these panels, and those panels flip out, uh, and you can actually see them in space. And they were floating around in space, and because they were shiny, uh, as the astronomers were watching through the telescope, they could periodically see the flash of the sunlight off these panels. And so they actually spent a lot of time watching that, and they could actually invite visitors to come up to Chabot and look through the telescope and actually see those flashing panels. Uh, they were called the SLA panels. Uh, let's see. Cliff asks, how many other sites sent NASA numbers, or was Chabot the only one? I, actually, I'm not sure how many uh, total sent the, the data. I did read a paper. It mentioned quite a few, but it sounded like some of them only were involved in one of the missions. Others were involved in several. So I can't really answer that question for you. Sorry. Uh, Russell asks, I read that Tom Hanks helped with this. Was he one of the students helping at Chabot? Tom Hanks was a teenage volunteer at Chabot, but my understanding is he was not actually involved in the Apollo observations, uh, but he was a teenage volunteer at Chabot. Uh, he was a student at Skyline High School. So, uh, you know, we like to claim a little fame there uh, because Tom Hanks was once involved with our organization. Uh, Cynthia asked, maybe resume Friday nights post lockdown? Well, we're talking about it. Uh, we may have to do that a little differently than we've done it in the past. In the past, we always had people lined up close together. Uh, when and if we are able to resume observations through the telescope, uh, we're going to have to do it a little differently. In fact, I'm having a meeting with some of the, uh, the telescope operators next Wednesday, and we're going to talk about how we're going to work that out. But yes, we definitely hope to resume both Friday and Saturday night observing sometime after all of this craziness ends. Yeah, let's see here. Rick Taft, uh, did NASA provide coordinates for the initial pointing of the telescope? Uh, yes, uh, there was an organization called Bellcom, and they were computing the position of the spacecraft and providing that to all of the observatories that were involved in this program. And that allowed Chabot to get the telescope pointed in roughly the correct direction. Um, so uh, yes, they did get it, data, the Bellcom got their data from NASA, from the flight plans, and then they were able to compute uh, an orbit in the rough position of where we should look for the telescope or for the spacecraft. And then the astronomers pointed the telescope there. They had to search around a little bit until they spotted it. Uh, let's see, is there still a connection to NASA? Well, yes, we are still associated with NASA. We still associate with NASA Ames Research Center. In fact, there's some new things that are going to be coming up, which I can't tell you all of it just yet but eventually there was, we're going to have a much closer relationship with the uh, NASA Ames Research Center. But we also uh, use one of our telescopes here, the 36-inch reflectors. We use it for searching for and tracking near-Earth asteroids. And that data eventually goes to NASA. It goes first to the International Astronomical Union's Minor Planet Center. Uh, they crunch the numbers and, and combine it with the data from other observatories. And then the, the, uh, the results go to NASA's JPL, uh, Jet Propulsion Lab down in Pasadena. Now let's see. 
from Chara, Chiara, age 10. How old is the telescope used to plot the re-entry? So the telescope we used was the telescope you see behind me. This is Rachel. And Rachel is 105 years old today. So it was built in 1915. So that makes it, what, uh, 55 years old in 1970. I think I did the math right. <laughs> Let's see here. Who else we got? Okay, question from Chris. Was SHPO data the only data used? Actually, I think we already answered that. No, it was not. It was combined with data from the manned space flight uh, network. Uh, Amanda, I am impressed that the telescope is 100 years old. It's actually 105. Has the telescope technology not changed much since then? Actually, uh, telescope technology has changed quite a bit. Today, we would never build a telescope like this. Uh, almost all modern research quality or, or high quality telescopes are reflecting telescopes using mirrors. We do have a, a reflecting telescope here, the 36 inch reflector. Uh, that's the one we use for the asteroid program. Uh, we keep this telescope because it was so well, well built, it's still working. And it's a great telescope to look at and admire and appreciate the technology that was around in 1915 and the workmanship that went into the telescope. And I mentioned the other telescope, the eight inch uh, refractor, that's Leia. That telescope was built in 1883. It's also a refractor, it's smaller than Rachel. It also is still working. So it's a testament to the quality of the workmanship, you know, 100 plus years ago that these telescopes are still being used today. Uh, Lauren asks, can you explain how the spacecraft could bounce off the atmosphere back into space? Well, if they hit the atmosphere at too shallow an angle, the friction with the upper atmosphere would be enough to deflect the spacecraft's flight path and actually cause it to veer off back out into space. Um, it would enter the atmosphere a little bit, but then it would be deflected by the increasing density of the atmosphere, and that would cause it to veer back out into space. Unfortunately, when they re-enter, they only have the command module. They don't have the service module. They don't have the LAM anymore. And the command module itself has no uh, means of propulsion uh, that would allow them to get back into orbit around the Earth or back into the atmosphere if they bounced off of it. So they didn't want that to happen. Uh, Bob asks, what was the system for designating the lunar module from the command mo or disengaging the lunar module from the uh, command module and how was that unable to happen without yeah let's see um, the lunar module was already connected to the command module at the time that the accident occurred uh, there is a docking mechanism between the command module and the lunar module uh, it's a, a series of latches that basically grabs on, grabs onto the two and holds them together. Uh, there's a tunnel that goes between the two modules. Uh, that tunnel uh, has a hatch on either end. Uh, when they were attached together, they'd remove the hatches so they could go back and forth between the two modules. Um, at the time, they needed to disengage, which was just before re-entry. Uh, they climbed back into the command module, uh, closed up that tunnel, and then disengaged the latches. And I, I'm not sure, and maybe Rusty Swiker can get on here and answer this question. I'm not sure whether it was a, a spring mechanism or whether it was actually some kind of a propulsion system other than the, the uh, RCS jets on the, the command module that got them to separate from the lunar module. Uh, so they didn't need the oxygen supply. The, the service module was basically dead. So they couldn't use the engine on the service module. So they had to use the LEM engine to make their course corrections. And then they had to uh, 
disconnect from the limb just before they re-enter the atmosphere. Um, Noah, age six. Did at any point NASA think that the spacecraft could explode? Well, early on, yeah, they were pretty concerned about it. They didn't really know what was happening at first. Um, when Jack Swikert uh, pushed that button to stir the tanks, uh, they heard a loud bang, and then all hell broke loose inside the spacecraft, uh, caution and warning lights, letting them know that they were losing electrical powers and losing pressure in the tank and so forth. And they weren't really sure what had happened at first. When you're inside the command module and it's attached to the service module, you can't see the service module. So they couldn't look and see that there had been an explosion. It wasn't until a little later on that uh, uh, Jim Lovell noticed uh, gas venting out at the side. He could see that through the window on the, the command module, or I think he was actually looking through the window on the LEM, and uh, he saw gas venting out the side, and that gave them a clue as to what had happened. Um, what did NASA learn from this? Well, <laughs> that goes into part of the reason why the accident happened in the first place. Um, the, uh, the accident happened because of an incident that occurred several years earlier, right after the Apollo 1 explosion. The oxygen tank that was in the Apollo 13 service module was originally in another service module. And after the Apollo 1 uh, fire uh, at the Cape in 1967, they uh, decided to make some modifications to the whole Apollo stack. And so they took the oxygen tank out of that uh, service module. When they did that, they did it with a forklift device and there was an accident that caused the vent valve on the top of the tank, the oxygen tank, to be damaged. And although they thought they had repaired it, it turned out it was not completely repaired. And long story short, that eventually resulted in a incident uh, a couple of weeks before the Apollo 13 flight where they were testing everything and they filled the tank after it was all back in the service module. They filled the tank, uh, did some testing, and then it was time to empty the tank. Uh, they could not get the tank meant to work correctly, so they decided to heat the tank to kind of get the more pressure to, to vent it. What they didn't realize is that that vent was damaged worse than they originally thought. There was also an uh, issue with the voltages that were used at the, uh, the Cape. Uh, they had changed between 1967 and 1970. That caused uh, the heating circuit to overheat the tank, which melted the insulation on the wiring that went to the fan that was supposed to st stir the tank. And that was not detected until Jack Swikert pushed that button and got a short circuit inside the tank and that caused the explosion. So um, it was more of a quality control lesson that they learned, um, but they also learned that they could figure things out even in an emergency. I think one of the, the outstanding things is the, the cooperation between mission control and uh, the astronauts in trying to um, recover from a pretty serious situation, a life-threatening situation. And it's, it's uh, to this day considered one of the finer moments in NASA's history. Uh, let's see, Michelle asks, is the Chabot tel Telescope still an active telescope? Well, like I say, Chabot's Telescope is still being used for public observing. Uh, Prior to the coronavirus uh, shutdown, we were opening these telescopes every Friday and Saturday night. Uh, weather permitting, we'd invite people to come up and take a look through it. Um, let's see, Cynthia, what is Tom Hanks' connection to the Chabot Observatory? Well, I mentioned that earlier. Tom Hanks was a teenage volunteer at Chabot for a while. To my knowledge, he was not involved in this particular program, but he was a uh, teenager who came up to Chabot. Uh, 
Okay, how are we doing on time here? We're getting pretty close to our nine o'clock time. <coughs> Excuse me, I'll answer a few more questions here. Uh, Elsa asked, was Conrad part of the, the crew? I believe Conrad was here, but I don't know that he was uh, part of the observing crew, at least not for the Apollo 13 mission. Uh, I've got a write-up of home done by Terry Galloway, and he does not mention Conrad, so I don't believe he was involved, although he might have been one of those teenagers. What was the range of the temperatures experienced by the astronauts? Well, normally the interior of the spacecraft is a very comfortable room temperature. Because they lost power to the command module, uh, the heating system in the command module was no longer operational. So after a while, it got very cold. The lunar module was not designed to provide a comfortable uh, environment for that much space. So uh, it got pretty cold inside the spacecraft. And uh, if you watch the Apollo 13 me movie, you'll see it got so cold they were actually getting ice on their instruments. Uh, Deborah asks, what kind of research do the Chabot telescopes do now? Uh, the only thing we're doing right now is the, uh, the asteroid search program. Uh, and we do that with the 36-inch telescope. This telescope was involved, the uh, Rachel was involved for a time in the exoplanet program, but that's not happening anymore. <coughs> okay, let's see here. Kind of scrolling down here, i being told that Rusty answered the question. Oh, he says it's uh, as far as uh, why the, uh, the command module would uh, skip off the atmosphere uh, and go back out into space. He says it's like skipping a stone off the surface of a lake. And yeah, let's see. And he says that it was a spring that was involved in detaching the uh, the lunar module from the uh, the command module. It's kind of what I thought. <clears throat> okay. Uh, question here, very good question. How do I donate to Chabot? Well, if you go to Chabot's website uh, and look around, you'll find a donation page. And we could very much appreciate donations right now. Because we are closed, uh, like everybody else, for the coronavirus shutdown, uh, Chabot is not getting any revenue right now. And so anything that folks can do to help out, even small donations, would be very much appreciated. Um, we've had to uh, let quite a few people go. We, we have been able to participate in the SBA program to bring them back. Um, but that gives you an idea how tight our, our budget is right now. So any donations would certainly be appreciated. Uh, and again, just go to the Chabot website, ChabotSpace.org. Chabot Space is all one word. Uh, and if you look around on the website, you'll find a donation page. And please have at it. Donate all you can. We appreciate it. <clears throat> Okay, a couple more questions here, and then I think it's going to be time to wrap it up here. Did NASA know that it was possible to safely return to the Earth without the service module before the explosion? I suspect they really had never thought about it that way. Uh, it was quite a surprise, and, uh, you know, after about it for a while, they realized they could use the engines on the uh, uh, lunar module to do most of what they needed to do. And that actually turned out to work pretty well. Uh, but uh, as far as I know, they had never done any kind of a uh, simulation where they were not able to use the service module and they had to get back using the LEM. So I think that was a new experience for them. Uh, Andy asked, what was your role 
you know a lot of detail. Well, like I say, I wasn't involved in this part of the program, but I do have a, a master's degree in space studies. I've been associated with Chabot for 20 years, and I worked in the space industry for 40 years. So a lot of the technology that we're talking about, a lot of the resources that we've been talking about and that I use in preparing for this uh, are very familiar to me. Uh, so I've got a pretty strong background that, that helps doing this. Uh, what steps are taken to avoid the buildup of static electricity on the spacecraft? That's a good question. Um, all of the spacecraft metal components have to be um, electrically grounded, if you will, so that any static charges that build up uh, can be dissipated across the, the structure of the entire spacecraft. Uh, that's still an issue today. Uh, one of the things I did in my career was work on a lot of satellites, and there's a lot of effort that gets put into dissipating static electricity and basically every component has a way of grounding it to the structure of the spacecraft. So static electrical charges that build up get very quickly dissipated. Uh, let's see, I think we're getting pretty close to the end here. I see one more comment from uh, Russell, Rusty Swiker. He says it got really cold, emphasis on the really cold in the lab. I believe it. Uh, you know, the astronauts, when they rode uh, the, when they, in the normal mission, when they rode the LEM down to the, uh, uh, the surface of the moon, they were wearing their full spacesuits. So uh, it, it's, you know, that helps them stay warm. Uh, and that the LEM was definitely not designed to warm the, the whole airspace of the entire, uh, you know, command module and the lunar module together. So. Rusty's right, it got really cold. Okay. And let's, let's do one more here. Uh, lots of people saying thank you. You're very much welcome. Um, Oh, here's a comment from, from our, our membership manager, Eric Kabanach, and he reminds us that another option for supporting Chabot is to join as a member of Chabot. And again, you go to the website to do that, get lots of privileges if you're a member, and that's another way you can support uh, Chabot. So I think that we're getting pretty close to the end here. I think it's time to wind it up. I want to thank everybody for their attention, and I want to remind you again that uh, on the 25th, uh, next Saturday, uh, Dave Rodriguez, who was one of those teenagers involved in this program, will be also giving a presentation. He's going to go a lot more detail about how they actually did it and uh, his own personal experiences and, and impressions of that event. So. Again, thank you very much. Hope you folks all have a good evening. Uh, don't forget to wash your hands after you're done with your computer. Uh, and stay safe, stay home, and we'll catch you next time. Good night.